of these possible changes mean the left wing majority and the strong Eurosceptic showing? Uh, now, unlike blocks like left wing or right wing Eurosceptics are united by a label, but we're not necessarily united by their goals. They are by default, by definition, they defend what they consider national interest, how much collaboration can you have. Will this block be a set of individual party representatives or will it really a block? We don't know this. And finally, how strong will be the participation in the elections? How strong will be the mandate of the parliament if the uh, participation is low? Uh, we will see all of this. Uh, we begin with uh, Claudia Heffler, who is a research assistant and a PhD student at the Jean Monnet uh, Chair at the University of Cologne. And she has interest in European identity and European uh, parliaments. So over to Claudia. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's my honor. I will start from a very abstract level and the topic of my presentation is democratic legitimacy and problems of identity. And I put the question, is it a union of shared values or of shared interests? I should have probably added one neither nor because there's this whole level of contestation of value and interests that we have in common. Um, so what's the What's the puzzle? What's the uh, question I would have talked about? Oh, sorry. No, here we go. Um, well, the EU project started as, as a completely elite driven project, and um, the whole integration process um, of treaty reforms, the concurrency, and, and the rise, rounds of enlargement um, were pretty much accompanied by a permissive consensus among the citizens. Um, so you could also term it as a lack of interest. And um, so in this time of, of a permissive consensus, we sh there was some enthusiasm and, and quite some support, but we probably couldn't see it as from European identity evolving. Um, at, at the very latest of the Euro crisis, I believe everybody woke up and the citizens realized that Europe does have an impact. Just is it for good or is it for worse? So what I will look into in uh, this presentation is how is the meaning of the European Union constructed throughout the financial crisis before and after. And I think this question is uh, ever more important with the upcoming elections. Um, to answer the question, I will start um, with the definition of a democratic deficit in a substantial way. Um, look at what is collective identity, what can we see as European identity, and then go into my analysis of discourse in Germany. I chose Germany as a case study because it would be a country where you would most likely expect that there's some European identity and value-based argumentation for European cooperation due to its um, history. Um, yeah, there are a lot of arguments about why the EU has a democratic deficit, which rather look at the output or at the procedures. Um, but here I want to look at a very substantial critique um, saying that there's a, substan a substantial democratic deficit because uh, the citizens don't feel like uh, European citizens. We don't see one um, whole of EU citizenry, but just a, a, a sum of national citizens um, grouped together. And the argument goes that for democracy at EU level, and especially with a European Parliament representing European interests, we would need some degree of a European identity um, to, to give cohesion and durability to the project. Um, so Representation needs some effective link between the ones representing and the ones represented. Um, and identity is like that concept which can very well grasp this effective link between the citizens and, and the polity. I have a citation of Levy who nicely puts this, um, the relevance of this effective link and emotional side of, of identity for democracy, um, yeah, 
It's on the slide. So what is uh, collective identity? Well, it's, it's the link of, of the individual with the group. And since the EU is very young, we have to look at how can we conceptualize change in identity. And therefore, I take a social constructivist approach, um, which um, says that meaning <coughs> of something is created through language. So there are objective facts, but the way they are interpreted gives them the meaning. If a tree is hit by lightning, you can interpret it as a natural catastrophe or, or as God's punishment, and very different consequences arise depending on the interpretation. Um, and so I ask if the EU is this objective fact we are looking at here, how is the meaning of it constructed, in, in which way? And so I look at communication um, about the EU, about the construction of, of the value of European integration. Um, yes, on what does it depend on how the meaning of the EU is con constructed? Um, there are a variety of reasons, but one is that it's the national identity and the national tradition. So you can conceptualize the social identity in layers, and we all belong to very different groups, be it the family, the profession, church, sports, and the nation. Um, and this doesn't give any conflict as long as the values are somehow in line with each other. Um, and Hoke and Marx defined um, the idea of inclusive and exclusive national identities. So an uh, inclusive national identity will formulate its values in the way that international cooperation is likely and, and has its values, and an exclusive national identity rather looks at the, um, strictly at the borders and focuses on the national sovereignty and independence. Um, and the EU is then uh, conceptualized as an additional layer beyond those national identities, and I was surprised to see the little buttons which look a lot like my um, image on the slide, just we put Europe at the heart, and I've added it as an extra layer. Um, so, yeah, what uh, this uh, points out is that it's also a question how, how they go together, and um, that, that maybe there's not an abstract extra level of European identity, but that it's nationalized European identities which would suffice. So we would see different kinds of European identity in each country, and they somehow mix up with each other and have to have to match. Okay, so that was quickly on the relevance of, of identity for democracy and how to conceptualize this um, term. I then want to go into the discourse analysis of um, how this European identity narrative is framed in Germany. Um, yes, discourse analysis is an, an, a tool to look at the quality and quantity of arguments uttered in a debate. Um, so I group single statements. I read through a whole lot of uh, plenary debates and, and coded single statements to types of arguments and looked at their frequent, frequency. And again, Germany would be the case where it's most likely to expect um, the formulation of a European identity. Um, due to its uh, history, it, it tries to demonstrate trustworthiness and, and puts a value in cooperation. Um, Yes, uh, so the databases are 23 plenary debates um, and it goes over time, so looking at the time before the Euro crisis from 2005 to 2008 and comparing it to, to the financial crisis and sovereign debt crisis following thereafter, um, wondering if there's change because you would expect that um, with crisis you need some identity before to, to have continuity. Um, the scheme of analysis, however, covers a bit broader range. Um, so, on the one hand, I, I look at the EU level and how is the discourse on the EU itself framed. Um, on the other hand, I also included the relation of member states um, as a second level because, in a way, how do you relate to the other member states also touches upon um, what the EU is for you. Um, and the three columns are either normative support or a ut 
totalitarian interest-based support or contestation, and only a normative support for the EU would be speaking properly in European identity narrative, um, but interest-based can still be a basis for, for uh, community building later on. And contestation, yes, I put an example uh, that's quite soft in, in, in German discourse. Um, it's not so substantial, it's more contestation of the current situation of the European Union. Mm. So that's pretty much um, the basis of, of the analysis where I fit the different types of arguments in. I have an example for what would be, I only uh, threw in the um, different boxes, examples of the types of arguments you would expect. A union for peace could be the formulation, Europe is not only about an economic community or monetary, monetary union, it's also about a region in which legal uncertainty, welfare states, free movement, freedom of speech and the press without corruption prevail. So that's a very value-based um, argument for European cooperation. While the other one which occurred a lot is the EU as global actor, so defending cooperation on the basis that we need to be an international actor. And um, for example, it's in this language, in the age of globalization, the power of nation states decreases to solve problems in the interest of their population. The European Union is the answer to this. So somehow of the um, interdependence in the international system arguing for EU cooperation. Um, and these are the results of the analysis. So the dark blue is the, the, the aggregated number of all value-based arguments. The highlight blue are the interest-based ones and the orange is contestation. And this uh, slide only shows results for the discourse on the European Union as such. Um, and you can somehow see that so the change over time is the most important aspect of it. And you can see how value-based is really strong, so the Union for Peace and we I mean, have shared history and shared values. And also the interest-based argument as, as the global actor was an example. They start out almost on the same level, that the interest-based arguments get really strong, but somehow the values come back and they meet in the middle. And all arguments contesting the value of European Union don't touch upon the substance. They don't put into question if we should be together at all, or if we should just uh, stop with European integration. But they're just about the direction, should be more social um, and more democratic. However, looking at the second level of how the relations among member states are framed, then there's a dramatic increase on the focus of, of German interests. So um, these arguments are still pro-EU, saying yes, it's in the German interest to be in the European Union, but this was not very present around 2005 to 8, and then grew dramatically. And I would argue that this is really the hidden existence you can find in Germany. So the, the pro-EU discourse is remained when, when politicians at elite level talk about European Union. But behind that, the focus on German interests somehow puts into question the European identity. Because if you look at German voters and only focus on your own uh, national community, it just contradict a European we a thinking in European interests. Um, to sum it up, I looked into the relevance of collective identity for representative democracy and uh, the German case in more detail. I expected Germany to be the most likely case for positive depiction of European um, integration. And while we can see this continued pro-European discourse, somehow below there are some hidden resistances. Um, but overall it's still very soft, very positive. So what's the relevance for the EP elections? Well, I, I have two consequences from, from the analysis. So of course on the one hand the representativeness of the European Parliament is a bit put into question if there's no shared European identity. How can there be a shared representative body? And um, second, looking more into the German discourse, um, the way that it's still very positive.
obviously if I only look at the narrative at the elite level, what did parliamentary um, debates show how, how politicians frame the European Union, but it, uh, it's open whether that actually relates to how the citizens feel. Um, it would be necessary to look into the surveys and um, I took a quick look at the predictions for the elections. And, um, I, get, I believe there's a gap that the very pro-European discourse um, doesn't really represent uh, what all citizens feel and that that gives room for more extremist parties um, to suck up that space uh, for those people who feel their interests are not really represented and who are more skeptical. And um, yes, the rise in the new skeptic parties is predicted here as well. Finally, I want to thank you for your attention.